Hi everyone, this is Ken Stoltzfus again. I'm uh, going to be talking tonight about clinical geropsychology. This is really just working with older adults, or what we might call elders. Uh, that's the term I'll be using tonight when we uh, talk about older people. So I want to start off just with a little exercise. This doesn't work quite as well by video as it would in person, but I think you'll get the idea. I want to show you just a series of pictures. Um, there are pictures of elders, and I want just I want you to just be aware of your initial reaction to these to this series of pictures. How does this make you feel? What does this make you think? And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So I won't be saying anything for a few minutes while I scroll through these pictures. So again, just give me your first reaction to the pictures. So, you know, again, if we were in class together, I'd ask you as a group to think about your reactions to the pictures. And students often have mixed reactions. I personally have mixed reactions. You know, some people see weakness and frailty. Other people see um, elders as cute or sort of childlike. Um, some see them as very innocent. Some people start to think about other aspects, too. And then we'll talk about this in a minute, but some of the positive aspects of, of elders. Now, one of the things that this is closely linked to is your culture's belief about elders. Some cultures see elders as a source of wisdom, leadership, people who are still capable of productivity. Other cultures and other people from cultures like this tend to see elders as frail, sort of funny in, in kind of a negative way, grumpy, dangerous drivers, people who are outdated, people who are past their prime. So one of the things that we want to think about tonight as we're going through this, this presentation or this short lecture is how do these sorts of beliefs affect the lives of elders? Now, obviously, you're going to have a different life if people treat you as a source of wisdom than if people treat you as sort of humorous or kind of funny, you know, again, in a not so nice way. And I will say, as an American, I come from a culture that tends to really see elders as kind of frail and grumpy and humorous and doesn't really take them very seriously. I think this is starting to change a little bit, but you know, in a lot of movies, a lot of TV shows, there's an older person who's kind of grumpy and kind of mean, or says silly things, maybe they're not all quite there mentally. And so this really isn't very fair. You know, and I, gr I grew up, uh, you know, where sometimes we'd be out driving in a car, my friends and I, and if there's an older person in the car in front of us, somebody would say, oh, come on, Grandpa, move it along. Or people would say, oh, you're driving like an old lady, meaning you're driving really slow. And, and so, again, you sort of get, sometimes just by the comments we make and the sort of humor that we make, get the sense that there's a culture that doesn't really value elders very much. One of my friends, one of my coworkers here at the new university that I teach at in the U.S., he's from Africa, and he talked about how amazed he was when he came here to see um, older people being put in nursing homes, being put in these nursing facilities, we call them in the U.S., which is really a place that we send people when nobody else wants to care for them anymore, where their family doesn't want to care for them. And they're really sort of these medical institutions where people just go to live until they die, and they don't really have a very good life at all. This would be sort of like the elder care homes, um, some of which you guys visit in Klaipeda. And you'll know if you've been to both the elder care homes in Klaipeda, there's one that's pretty nice, and there's one that's not so nice. And so even what those facilities are like make a difference. But my friend from Africa was very sort of wary or very concerned even about the good facilities because he said, where are these people's children? Where are the other people that are kind of taking care of older adults? Why is it that they get sent to this institution instead of being valued and loved by their children, by their families, by their culture in, in general, their society in general? So obviously a lot, of, a lot of things to think about here just in terms of how our cultures tell us about elderly people and what's important about them, what they're like. And then there's another layer to this beyond how these beliefs affect the lives of elders. We also need to think as psychologists, how do these cultural beliefs affect the psychological treatment of elders? Because if you're a psychologist, but if you, believe, if you uh, see an older adult who might come to visit you as somebody who is you know, unlikely to be able to do very much, somebody who's not likely to have a very good life, um, you're, you're probably not going to put the same sort of investment into treating them as you would a younger person. And so we really want to be careful about that. We want to see uh, that elders have a lot of potential and a lot of opportunity, many of them, 
to continue to grow and develop even, even at the age that they're at. So thinking about uh, the issue of working with elders, one thing that's helpful to think about is Erickson's developmental stages. Erickson suggests that people who are 40 to 64, and that's quite a large age range, you know, people in their 60s would often be considered getting into older life or older adulthood. People in their 40s are still very much in middle age. So we're thinking right now about more the, the latter part of that, of that um, time span, people kind of getting in their late 50s, early 60s, as they're moving into old age or older age, at least, um, the, the uh, developmental crisis that Erickson suggests happens in this stage of life is generativity versus stagnation. So are people going to be generative? Are they going to be able to contribute to society in meaningful ways? Are they going to have meaningful work, meaningful relationships? Or are their lives going to just sort of stagnate and meaning that they're not going to really do much that's very productive? And so as people enter into old age, they're kind of finishing up that developmental crisis and moving into the next stage, which is ego identity versus, I'm sorry, ego integrity versus despair. And so this is when they're looking back and saying, have I been generative? Has my life been meaningful? Have I had integrity? Have I lived according to my values and beliefs? Or have I kind of been stagnant? Have I not contributed much? And the idea here is that if they don't, if they're not happy with what their life has looked like, they're very likely going to fall into despair. If they're happy with what they've done, if they feel like they've had a meaningful life, the older years can be a time of ego integrity, a time when they're feeling good about what they've accomplished in their life. This kind of ties in with an, with an idea that's been uh, gaining popularity over the last number of years in aging research. And this is the idea of productive aging. You know, historically, we thought about people once they reached a certain age. In the U.S., it's the mid-60s. Um, other cultures, it may be a different age. We kind of thought, well, they're really sort of done making a contribution and done growing and developing, and they just need to kind of exist or they need to just kind of be who they are until they pass away, until they die. And they need to start slowing down. They need to stop trying to do so much. There's been this new idea lately that says we should think about productive aging. We should think about aging as a time when people can continue to work if they want to. People can continue to volunteer. Um, or maybe they stop working, they retire, and they start volunteering. They, they are productive in other ways. They can start to take leadership in civic organizations and social, familial, or religious roles. That these are people who, have, who still have something to give. And, you know, there needs to be some balance here because there's also a thought in my culture where people are saying things like 70 is the new 40 or the new 50. And, you know, they're kind of all these little slogans. And sometimes that sets unrealistic expectations for people. So if we were treating an, an older person, an elder, we would want to send this message that you could still be productive, but we're not sort of attaching any, any, of, this, any of these new beliefs to you where you have to live a certain way even into older age. So some of this is very individual. We want to help people to decide what's going to be right for me as I age. Am I somebody who's going to be capable and interested in productive aging? Or as I age, is this a time when I want to slow down and kind of reflect and step back from some of the things I've been doing? And there's not a right or wrong answer here, but increasingly people have options. Whereas, whereas you know, before, maybe before 20 years or so ago, there's this really this idea that, well, you, you reach retirement age and you should sort of stop working, you should slow down, and you should sort of take things easy. That's not always the case anymore. Uh, some issues that we want to talk about or that I wanted to mention to you in terms of treating older adults or elders. Um, one is that there's a greater risk of debilitating illness and disability because people are living longer. You might think, well, living longer is a good thing. Why does that lead to increased illness and disability? Well, here's what happens. As people live longer, certain diseases that used to be less common, that only come out in very old age, have become more common. So, for example, Alzheimer's disease, and I'm, I'm forgetting the exact numbers here, but say Alzheimer's disease is diagnosed at 60 years of age um, on average. When people weren't living much past 60, 61, 62, 65, um, that, they were much less likely to, um, to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease I think I'm getting my ages a bit low here, but even say at 70, say that on average people are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and at 70 years of, all, of age, when the lifespan was 68 years old, which wasn't that long ago that people in the U.S. used to only live until 68, 70 years on average, now it's actually increased 10 years and people are living on average in the U.S. until 78. 
So you can see the older people get, the more likely they are to have something like Alzheimer's disease, which typically only emerges in very old age. Now, I will say sometimes you can have early onset Alzheimer's. So I've heard about people as early as in their 30s having Alzheimer's disease, but that's very uncommon. That's very unlikely. Um, for most people, it comes out later in life. And so the longer people live, the more cases of Alzheimer's disease we're going to see. And this is true for other forms of age-related dementia. For example, the second most common form of age-related dementia is what's called Lewy bodies dementia. And this is very similar to Alzheimer's, but the course of Lewy bodies is kind of an up and down course. So people will have moments of lucidity, moments of, co of coherence, and then they'll kind of fall back into the dementia. Whereas Alzheimer's tends to be progressive, Lewy bodies kind of tends to move back and forth from showing dementia symptoms to then periods of not showing dementia symptoms. So, for example, there was a man in a Sunday school class I taught when we lived in Ohio before I went to Lithuania, and he had Lewy bodies dementia, and he had had it for a very long time. Most, most of the time, people don't live very long with this. He had lived for 10 or 12 years with Lewy bodies dementia, and he liked to come and sit in Sunday school class, but usually he couldn't participate. He couldn't understand. He couldn't speak. But one day, we were talking in Sunday school class, and we were talking about loss, and we were talking about grief, and he all of a sudden had this very lucid moment where he sat up and said, I understand loss and grief. I've had a really hard time the last number of years, something along those lines. And all of us kind of looked at him because we were used to him not saying anything and not even really being very alert. But all of a sudden the moment was gone and he was kind of back to having the dementia symptoms. So another example, you know, would be the Lewy bodies dementia, which is another very common type of, of age related dementia. There are also some physical illnesses, like certain types of cancers that are really much more common as people move into the very old uh, ages of life. And so one example for men would be prostate cancer. Prostate cancer starts late in life and it's very slow moving. So somebody, so back when the lifespan was 68 or 70 years old, um, when the average life expectancy was 68 or 70 years, many people might have gotten prostate cancer in their late 60s, but they passed away of other causes before the prostate cancer started to cause problems. Well, now that people are living in my country until almost 80 years old, many, many more people who are diagnosed with prostate cancer and who eventually die from it and who need treatment for that. Um, and so all of these things, you know, in some way or another, could be issues that people would come to a psychologist for treatment for, whether it's Alzheimer's disease, where we might be diagnosing, we might be assessing, or whether it's dealing with um, something like cancer, where somebody knows that they're dying of cancer, these things are much more common nowadays than they would have been a generation ago because people are living long enough to have problems with these, with these diseases. A related issue that family members might talk to you about is the stress, what we call caregiver stress, the stress of caring for somebody who is um, living into their older years and who needs significant, a significant amount of help. In the U.S., we have a term for people who end up caring for both their own children and their parents, and we call them the sandwich generation. People who are middle aged who still have children at home or teenagers, and they also are caring for their parents. They, we call them the sandwich generation because they're sandwiched in between caring for two other generations. And often, the research says often it would be women who end up in this situation, at least in the US. They end up being the caregivers for both the children and the parents. And so this is something where even though it's not an issue that older adults themselves face, you may need to remember if you're treating an older adult as a, as a psychologist, that um, their, their caregivers may be dealing with the stress that comes from being a caregiver. Some other issues that might come up when we're treating elders. One would just be the fast pace of technological changes. And I've seen this during my lifetime. So I graduated from university in 1994, and I just barely you know, remember my very last year of university, my girlfriend at the time emailed her brother. And I had never seen email before. I, I had typed all my papers on an old typewriter, an electric typewriter. By 1997, when I entered my graduate program, everybody had computers and everybody was emailing and using the internet. And so people who kind of grew up before the 1990s, they really don't understand often, they don't understand things like email, things like the internet, um, social media, even cell phones. And it's not that people can't use them but they're not sort of natural. They, they, especially, you know, the older they are, the less kind of experience they've had with this, the more they're set in other communication and technological patterns. And, and often they struggle to kind of use these tools. 
So like my father, who's in his 60s, he's not old, he's still active, he's still productive, he's working, but he's just not somebody who has much time for the internet. You know, he will occasionally get on the internet to play checkers, he likes to play checkers online, but he really doesn't do much with email, he doesn't do anything with Facebook, he's just learned how to send SMS messages on his cell phone. Just, you know, he, he kind of doesn't use technology the same way even somebody of my generation does. And then, of course, people of your generation, those of you who are um, traditional age students in your 20s, you're very comfortable with this. You're what we call digital natives, where you've grown up with this sort of technology and you're very comfortable with it. And so one thing we'd have to remember is that this can be disorienting for elders. They can kind of, all of a sudden, they're living in a world where people don't talk to each other nearly as much. And even the telephone is sort of outdated. And people are knowing things and getting information in different ways. People don't go to the library and check out books when they have a question. They go to Google, right? And so all these changes can be sort of disorienting and, and confusing for people who are elders. Another issue that, that elders face is ageism. And this would just be age discrimination in employment and other settings. And so often people who are older often still need to make money. We know that being, being elderly is actually a risk factor for poverty. So people are needing to work later into life. But for people who lose their job when they're 50s or later, it's often difficult to find another job because people kind of think, oh, this person's slowing down. They might not be as sharp mentally. We have all these stereotypes about older adults, and that makes it hard for people to get jobs. Elders often feel uh, sort of displaced or out of touch with what's going on in society. For example, in the U.S., where it's become increasingly common for people either to delay getting married until their 30s, or just never to get married, just to live together, that can be very upsetting and very confusing for elders who didn't, who grew up in a time where you did not live with somebody that you weren't married to. And so some of these shifting social norms, in the U.S., we've moved towards a very accepting stance in society towards gay marriage, towards gay rights. That can be very disorienting. That sort of thing is just so different from what elders grew up with. It can be very difficult and can actually even have you know, not not psychological effects to the point where somebody can be diagnosed with a disorder just because of that, but it can be very troubling to people and people can be very concerned about what's the direction that the world's going. Elders often deal with a great deal of loneliness and so some of them may come into therapy partly just because of lack of connections with other people. Their, their friends, their spouses may have died or they may be very sick and kind of not able to communicate, not able to to socialize anymore. And so often elders are very lonely. And, you know, as I said a moment ago, they've lost their peer group due to death or due to an inability to travel to see each other. And then finally, there's the issue, issue of institutionalization. An awful lot of elders end up in institutions, they end up in nursing homes and elder care facilities. And, you know, ideally we would have other options for these folks. Ideally, they'd be able to live with their families or we'd have some, you know, maybe more humane or more, uh, uh, personable kinds of environments for these folks. Unfortunately, often institutions are the only alternative. There are some institutions that are doing interesting work to try to make um, elder care homes or nursing facilities, as we call them in the U.S., to make them more humane. And so there's a group called the Eden Alternative. And if you're interested in this, you might want to you might want to do a Google search on them. They have some very interesting ideas about how to make nursing facilities, elder care homes, how to make them a nurturing environment. So for example, they'll say, instead of a hallway with fluorescent, fluorescent, stark fluorescent lighting and institutional colors and, you know, an institutional setting, what if that, that leads to a series of just single rooms off the hallway, which is often what these facilities look like, right? Just a long hallway with bright lights and then individual rooms off those lights. They'll say, what if, what if those hallways came open to spaces that were kind of large spaces with couches and plants and a piano and tables and people could go and sit there and talk? What if there were sort of natural areas for people to congregate and get together? And even people who are nonverbal or people who couldn't get around very much, somebody could kind of wheel them out to that area and they could sit there and at least be around other people rather than sitting isolated in their rooms. These institutions often also include um, gardens where people could go outside and garden. And sometimes they'll raise the gardens up on raised platforms so that people who can't kneel down or can't sit on the ground, people who are in a wheelchair, could still find a way to garden. Often these institutions, these even alternative homes, will have school children and, and um, pets come in. And the elders can help the children with their homework if they're still able to do that. 
and the children can kind of just be a source of life and energy for the elders. So even for institutionalized people, um, if it's a good institution, there are some ways to help people to be productive and have generative aging rather than just kind of sitting in a room waiting to die. And of course, that's an issue for psychology, right? We want to we want to work towards human flourishing. We want to work toward human development and growth, even in the latter stages of life. So some psychological issues that we deal with that are that are more treatment issues or diagnoses. Um, one is dementia. And I've already gone over that, but of course, dementia is loss of one's cognitive abilities due to age or other other issues. Um, and so I, we've already sort of talked about that. I'll talk a little bit more in a moment about the treatment of dementia. There are a couple of theories on that. Another thing that you might not expect that's becoming a big issue, at least in the U.S., is substance dependence. There are more and more cases of older adults, of elders, who are starting to use and abuse drugs, but they look very different than somebody who's on the street drinking or using drugs. What often happens in the U.S. is that these folks get addicted to their pain medication. So doctors prescribing some sort of opioid pain medication and the older, the older person gets addicted to this, and then they start using more of it. And in the US, we call it doctor shopping. Well, they'll go to different doctors, give them the same symptoms, or perhaps even exaggerate the symptoms a bit to get more medicine. And this is illegal, but it's very different from somebody who's on the street injecting heroin, you know, and living under a bridge or something, but has devastating effects. And so in my field, in substance abuse treatment, um, 10 or 15 years ago, when I was kind of just starting off in the field, People have said, if you want to get into a lucrative line of work, a line of work where there's going to be a growing amount of business, you should get into treating older adults because they're starting to have this, this issue. And it's really been true. We've seen a lot more addiction among the elderly. We also see things like depression. And this probably isn't, uh, uh, isn't surprising that people get depressed as their family and friends die and as they um, are more isolated socially, as maybe their mental faculties start to slip, their cognitive abilities. It's obvious that people become depressed. People often become anxious as well. They feel kind of out of control. You know, somebody who might have been a very successful businessman or very, you know, well thought of person, all of a sudden they're, they're kind of, they're not working anymore. They don't really have as much of a formal role in society. They're not looked up to or valued the same way. That can lead to very anxious feelings. Like, am I still in control of my life? Am I going to be okay? Can I provide for myself? Can I meet my needs? It can lead to a sort of anxiety, and we see this in older adults. The other thing that we see is that people sometimes commit suicide when they um, reach later the later stages of life. And so this would be another issue that might lead somebody to seek psychological help if they're feeling suicidal. In terms of treatment, um, the American Psychological Association says that only 3% of psychologists are aging specialists. Um, so there's really, at least in my country, there's really an opening for this for people who specialize in working with older people. Now, I suspect that in the former Soviet Union, given what I know, and what, what we've talked about in class, what you guys have told me, I know that there's probably less likelihood that older adults would come to see a psychologist, partly because of the, the sort of way that psych psychological services were understood during the Soviet times. But over time, there's going to be more and more of a market for Psych psychology, I imagine, for older adults. And that might that might have not come into your generation, but at some point, I think people will be more comfortable with seeing a psychologist later in life. One of the things that we often say when we're talking about treating older people is that just the importance of being there and just being a, a, you know, a steady presence and having that therapeutic relationship, it can be so healing. We've talked about that all throughout counseling, talking about therapy. Even with dementia patients, even if they can't follow what you're saying, even if they can't understand you, just being a loving, caring presence to that person can be a very healing thing. And it's not going to ultimately get rid of their dementia, but it can be a very stabilizing sort of force in somebody's life. Another thing that we really want to do if we're working as psychologists with older patients is to learn from the wisdom of clients. We're probably going to want to be a little bit less directive with older adults because they're older than us and they know more about some things. They've had more life experiences. And so we're going to try to help them to reflect on their life experiences and see if they can learn and grow from those. So, you know, if they've, if they've kind of learned something about themselves, to remind them of that, to say, well, hey, you did this when you were 40 and 50 and you kind of, you know how to take care of yourself and it's going to be okay. You've got this wisdom, you've got this knowledge already. 
Uh, we can also benefit from using a systems perspective of involving uh, the social system of the person that we're treating. So getting their family, getting their social network, getting some, uh, some support from maybe even their church or their neighborhood. If possible, you know, there might be some people there who can help with the loneliness, who can help with the depression, who can kind of just be this, this um, caring presence for this person. Also, it's very important that older people um, are able to be involved in hobbies or in having some sort of stimulating experience. People who just sit and watch TV and don't go out much, they really tend to not do very well. They don't have very good outcomes because that's not a life-giving environment. If you're just kind of sitting, watching TV alone by yourself, um, we really want, whenever possible, to encourage our older clients to have a hobby, to have some interest we know even in terms of risk for dementia, the more people read, the more active their minds are, the more they do word puzzles and travel and see new things, the more actively engaged their mind is, the less likely they are to end up having dementia. And so it's very important to have some stimulation in people's lives. In terms of treatment approaches for dementia, I wanted to mention this because it relates to the article we've met, or we read for class, the Heppel article. There's two different, um, sort of theories about what we should do with clients who are dealing with dementia. One is what's called reality orientation, which says that we should constantly constantly be reorienting, reorienting a person with dementia to the person, place, and time, to that, that orientation times three that we talked about in the mental status exam. So if somebody thinks that they're at a different place and a different time, we need to constantly be telling them who they are, where they are, what they're doing, that kind of thing. But this can be sort of stressful for the client. And so the HEPL article says validation therapy, which is that we can kind of validate and engage the client without trying to reorient them. So if they think they're back in 1954 getting ready to go roller skating with their high school sweetheart, we don't really argue with that. We kind of just engage them around whatever they believe they think that they're going to do or think that they are. So an example of this, my wife's grandmother, who just passed away recently, had dementia for about 14 years. And we would go to visit her. She got to the point where she couldn't be at home anymore because she was dangerous. She couldn't kind of maintain herself. But she was visited quite often by her husband. Her husband went in every day to visit. And we would go in to visit whenever we were back in the U.S. and we were in town. Well, she would sit there and tell us that she was going roller skating. She liked to roller skate. Or she would count her fingers and she would get 11 fingers when, of course, she only had 10. We didn't argue with her and tell her she had 10 fingers. We just kind of counted along with her and encouraged her because we were sort of validating her. So this is less stressful. You know, the HEPA article kind of seems to suggest that this might be the better approach to take with older adults. Okay, that's it for the older adult or the um, uh, clinical geropsychology lecture. I hope that's been helpful just to think a little bit about how our society treats elders, what implications that has for psychological treatment, what some of the issues, both sociological issues and also clinical issues we might face, um, what those issues look like, and then just a little bit about how we treat somebody with dementia, because it is a different sort of thing than treating depression or treating anxiety. Okay, don't forget to take the quiz for this unit. This will be the last lecture and the last quiz. So this class is really coming to a close, um, but remember you have three written assignments due, so be checking the syllabus, make sure you get those written assignments done and get them submitted on time so that I can get everything graded and get your grades in by the end of the semester. Okay, uh, I miss being there with you guys in person. I hope you're all doing well. Please feel free to email me if you have any questions about any of the assignments. Okay, take care. Bye now.